Well, Bob, um, I was really very impressed in one of your recent lectures, um, which you repeated yesterday in our degree congregation, when you said that uh, due to all the advances in polymer synthetic methods, we can yeah. pretty much make anything, mm -hmm. and now it's our imagination that restricts us. Yeah. Did you mean that? And well, I mean, I, I mean it to a certain extent. I think we've come so far, and we can make so many new things over the last few years that we could even conceive of before. I'm sure there's still a lot of structures we need to work on, and we're pushing those edges. But I think making the point that it's really now imagination and not other limitations is really the important thing. So we, in my work, we've been very impressed with the advances that we can do for uh, in, in, in biological and therapeutics. Mm -hmm. yep. So we've been trying to use end group modification and, and block lengths to try and find ways to deliver drugs. Right, yep. No, that's you know that's a wonderful area. We, we've been doing work uh, in stuff that I haven't talked about very much, where we use more traditional and classical polymers for biomedical applications. So we've designed okay. uh, materials that you can control uh, with with light in a remote fashion, so that uh, we now have interocular lenses. These are lenses that go in after cataract surgery uh, that can be then tuned and, and refractive power changed after everything is healed. So again, that's not precise polymers, but it's another whole set of polymer principles. So I think there's a whole broad range of, of biomedical applications, and I think that's really going to be one of the most exciting areas. So one, one of the problems I find there is that uh, because of the, how tightly regulated it is, mm -hmm. it's very resistant to change. Change, yes. Yeah. And um, so therefore, uh, by the time if somebody protects something with a patent, mm -hmm. that it can get take so long that actually yes, right. it's it's, it's very difficult to, to break in. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's sometimes they don't actually, they're not looking for the innovations that we, we, we've That's got. It. Yeah. How do right. you see that? Oh, it, it, it's, it, it's really, really hard. I mean, for example, this material that we've made for the eye, we've been working on it for 12 years, and we're just entering phase three. So okay. it's, a, it's a very long-term, very long-term process. So, uh, but, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do them. It's just going to be, it's just very difficult to commercialize them and to convince people to pay you for 12 years so you can keep a product yeah, going. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really, that's really the issue. And the chemistry that we both do, we generally use transition metals as some type of catalyst, mm -hmm. not, not, not exclusively, but usually. Mm -hmm. And so then some of the issues could be removing the catalyst that right. people have perceptions about, yeah. or it mm. could be um, all sorts of, uh, of different things, purification, workup, cost. It, do you think there's one, one particular sticking point, or is it just getting everything? It is just getting everything right. together, and, and, and also, as you say, getting through all the regulations and doing all the tests. And, the, and so what I've found that's most useful is, is to work with clinicians. So yeah. clinicians who yeah. know exactly what the problem is, they say, here's a problem. If you can solve this problem, there's a chance. So then you've got an opportunity. But if you go out and say, I've got a solution to a problem, and you don't have a clinician who really believes that's the solution, that then you've got to sell the problem, you've got to sell the application, and then you've got to develop it. And that's a really long road to go. No, I think I'd agree with you. You've got to find somebody who's got a real problem, and actually they don't care how they solve the problem, oh, yeah, right, but yeah. they know that if they do that, will save right. someone's life or make somebody's life right, better. Yeah. Right. And otherwise you can just hit resistance yeah, from right. people to say, why should I use that? Why should I do that, yeah. And, and the other part of it is, too, is that I think a lot of the biomedical uh, work that's been done has been done in pharmaceuticals and small molecule medicinal kinds of things. Uh, I, I'm finding there's a, a large number of what I call just plumbing problems, which materials can, can yeah, solve. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, and so, so there's lots of places where biomaterials can be used to replace parts of the body. You can use them to, we're, we're working on all kinds of very bizarre applications, but uh, they're all just plumbing. There are, for example, in the eye, there's large numbers of areas, uh, the whole area of stem cells. Uh, there's the stem cell part, but then there's how do you deliver, how you keep them in place, how you get them to change into the right cells, et cetera. And that's all, again, a materials problem that I think, uh, that uh, I think chemists and polymer chemists can really make, up, make uh, contributions to. So, so, you, so your, your real fame is obviously metathesis and yeah. the Grubbs catalyst, etc. And yeah. I like to think of that as a, as a polymer tool, as a polymer oh. chemist. And, okay. uh, but obviously it can be used in different areas, mm -hmm. such as small molecules. Yep. Uh, is it, it, which, which, have you got a preference for the small molecule metathesis or the polymers? And oh, I don't care. I like uh, to see it used. 
Uh, in terms of uh, the early adapters, it was mostly the synthetic organic chemists in making rings. Yeah. And so in pharmaceutical industry and drug discovery and making new structures rapidly. So it's still being used there. Uh, the place where it's really exploding is in the green area uh, in the conversion of seed oils. And so okay. oils from soybeans and, and various other things. And so they're oils because they have double bonds in them. They're unsaturated. Yeah. Yeah. And if they're unsaturated, then one can do metathesis. So there's a company now formed in the U.S. Uh, where the company's called, called Elevance, and they've just announced a very large thing they call a biorefinery, which is going to yeah. be in Malaysia, which takes uh, palm oil. And the basic idea is instead of using petroleum uh, as a starting material is to use palm oil as a starting material, and, and then use metathesis to crack it into hydrocarbons and esters, and, and then turn it into a whole array of products. And so that is, I assume, is applicable to all of these oils that have got the, right, the olefins yeah. halfway down the chain, yeah. et cetera. It, so in the U.S., it's, it's, it's uh, soybean and corn and in Malaysia. And so basically any place there's oils that can be converted. And, and do, you, do you see the development of that restricted by, by the catalyst, or is that just fully developed and now it's, a, it's like a technical problem? In well, I mean, the better we can make the catalyst, the better it's going to be. But we've gotten down now to using in the, in the you know, low parts per million levels of catalysts, and so that really helps. And there's been some real advances made in the catalyst synthesis, which drops the cost. So there, there's some new developments maybe required, but the catalysts right now seem to be uh, on the level, so they, they are now starting to build these plants. So I was always, always impressed with the metathesis that um, many of the of the intermediates, which is brand new organometallic species that yeah. weren't really known until the, the mechanism was uh, yeah. elucidated. Yeah. And the mechanism, uh, once it was established, actually it seemed to me really helped the understanding and then the application of that. Yeah. And that sort of frustrates me in some of the newer things, that newer methods, yeah. not metathesis ones, that uh, we don't probably understand the mechanism as much as we'd like to. Yeah. How well, important do you yeah. think that mechanistic understanding of the grassroots chemistry, if you like, I mean, I, I've always operated on the principle that that's what you have to do to be able to move forward. Usually you find a catalyst by accident, yeah. uh, and, then, and then to be able to make the real advances, you then need to understand the details and how it works. And, and you know, Sometimes you make advances uh, by, totally by accident, but normally that's in the process of trying to understand how it works. And so you, you study the mechanism and you find a big surprise and that can really open up new applications. So I'll ask you, one story I heard about the ruthenium one was that uh, when you discovered that it would work better in the presence of water, yeah. was it Bruce Novak, one, right, of your, yeah. one of your, your guys, was trying to dry things as much as possible and it was getting worse and worse, worse, worse and yes. worse. That's true, yeah. And then that, what then made you realize that there was a eureka moment? You add water and it goes the other way, that's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it turns out again that that was well, once once we sort of started understanding it is is that the water was required for a redox reaction to take place uh, because we okay. put in uh, ruthenium three and it needed to make ruthenium two and water was part of that redox process. And is is ruthenium the the one that's used predominantly now, or is it are the different transition metals used? Well, if you depends on what you look at. So there's a huge. Uh, petroleum-based uh, metathesis okay. thing, which does you know, millions of pounds a year of converting ethylene and butenes into propylene. So it basically okay. rebalances yeah. the stream, and that's heterogeneous, and that's, that's tungsten catalyst, basically. Uh, in terms of applications in, the, in, uh, in organic synthesis and polymer synthesis, uh, most groups now seem to be using ruthenium. But there, yeah. but there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of places now where molybdenum is, is a better catalyst, uh, especially in, in stereoselective reactions. You've also had a tremendous number of um, people that go through your group that have got their own pretty yeah. successful yeah. careers all, all over the place. Yeah, right. uh, so what, what's giving you the most pleasure? Is it is the people going through? Is it the fact that you discovered this catalyst? Oh, it, I, mean, I mean, it's all part of the same thing. You know, it's all part of the, the, the career. And, and it's, really, it's really exciting to see to these young people who you know, show up in the lab, they're all incredibly bright and really talented and then yeah. watching them develop their own careers and make their own decisions and every, every four or five years, 
they disappear and a new group pops up. And so it's, uh, it's really fun watching this, this continuous stream. It's just like a sine wave in academia, isn't it? You, That's you, right. You've got to let the good people go as quickly as you can and yeah. uh, hope that another good person, another good person comes person through the door. Up, yeah. It's a bit better than the one you just let go. You have these students that, that, that are amazing and you wonder how you're ever going to survive without them and then they leave and, right, yeah. and, and usually uh, somebody else steps up and they do it in their own way, in a different way, but uh, they also take things forward then. In the UK, you'd be past retirement age and we'd be kicking you out the door. Right, and yeah. you told me last night that you've taken on another three or four students. Yeah. So what's, what's the future hold? Uh, I, I don't know. That's, uh, that's, uh, you know that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question that one has to ask. If you, if you have a defined retirement age, in some ways it's easy because then you can plan for that. Uh, I have to make a decision five years ahead and one doesn't know what situation is going to be five years away. So, you know, one has to maintain funding and research ideas and all of the efforts and how long one wants to do that is an interesting question. Well, I wouldn't disagree with that. Okay. So I think that's fantastic. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you.